It's a very wet Saturday afternoon at Bunga Beach on the New South Wales south coast. And this is the first view we've got of the area we've chosen to try to survive in. With me are five people who've been selected at random from the hundreds who first contacted us to come on this course. Our object is to try and see how perfectly urbanised man can survive in the bush with the very minimum of equipment. The only proper food we're taking for the entire fortnight is this 40 pound bag of rolled oats, which we're told will give us a basic starvation diet. We each of us have a knife. We have one axe, a flashlight, one billy can and some string, a length of wire, and because we're not very good at rubbing sticks together, we do have a box of waterproof matches. This afternoon, although it's now raining fairly steadily, we, our morale is still reasonably good. We've had our last civilised meal for a fortnight, and from now on we're going to have to fend for ourselves, living, as it were, completely off the land. But we have roughly two hours now to build a shelter, because we have no tent, so I suppose we'd better get on with it. The location for the exercise was a private estate near Bermagui on the New South Wales south coast, a rugged coastline with open paddocks and scrub shelving down to a rough pebbly beach. The first priority was building a shelter, and although we'd discussed more sophisticated designs, it seemed sensible to make the best use of the low branch of a bottle brush tree and lean uprights against it. Mike took the lead in selecting the young branches. Bev and Greg did most of the thatching. Judith and Julie took it upon themselves to get the fire going. It was never allowed to go out during the entire fortnight. Our spirits were still high, we still had the remains of a good lunch in our bellies, and the prospect of spending our first night on damp ferns was still something of a novelty. Having faithfully recorded our progress so far, the film crew presented their compliments and withdrew for the night to the comfort of a hotel in Bermagui. It was a very long night. When the crew returned the next morning, most people were still catching up on their sleep. The first and most obvious food supply which presented itself was rabbits. We hadn't actually seen any at this point, but we had seen their droppings and what we took to be their burrows. Mike hadn't set a snare since he was 12, but still remembered enough of his expertise to show Greg. Don't do that too tight, otherwise it won't run. I think you see the bandicoot more than a rabbit. We needed receptacles for drinking and eating. Our initial search of the location had revealed no clay to make pots. We didn't think it was cheating too much to use the inevitable beer cans and bottles we found washed up on the beach. There was more treasure in one of the paddocks, an endless supply of chicken wire, which we cut up into lengths to make fish traps. We needed bait of some sort. Beverly obliged by finding two dead terns in a fairly advanced state of decomposition. They're very light. Swimming like that. <laughs> right. It was scarcely a textbook design, but as we committed the fish trap to the deep, we felt confident that at least some fish would be stupid enough to swim into it and not be able to get out again. Water, at least, was never really a problem. There was a creek nearby, and even if the water in it didn't look too healthy, it tasted all right. Judith became the official water carrier. At first, we cautiously boiled all water because we were worried about liver flukes from sheep droppings. Later, it became a tedious chore. The water tasted better unboiled anyway, disease or no disease. That afternoon, the party prepared its first meal. The various foraging expeditions had yielded nothing apart from a few ferns and half an apple washed up on the beach, which we chopped up and put in the oats. Just try that. 
Why me? You're <laughs> 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 the hungry. You're the official taster. He's clean. The porridge was thick, gooey, and most unappealing. We were hungry, but not that hungry. It was becoming obvious that if we were to survive, we must find alternative food sources. Those alternatives were among the rock pools. There were plenty of winkles, not just the black variety, but the ones with candy stripes too. To these were added mussels. They were only small ones, but there were scores of them on the rocks just for the taking. But if there was variety among the shellfish, the choice of edible plants was something of a disappointment. The fiddlehead ferns varied enormously in taste. Some of them were crisp and full of sap. Others were unspeakably bitter and awful. We didn't know whether this was because the property owner had treated some of the paddocks with chemicals. Nettles, too, had been recommended to us, but although apparently of some nutritional value, were virtually tasteless when boiled. We long for fresh fruit of some sort. There were a few wild blackberries, but they weren't in season. There were some mysterious green plants with white crisp roots, which when boiled tasted like onions. They turned out to be daffodils. Ironically, things that we couldn't eat grew in profusion. The arum lily looked beautiful enough, but its roots and leaves are extremely poisonous. The burrowang palm has at its centre a spiny husk, which apparently contains prussic acid. The aborigines boil them to remove the poison. We weren't game enough. The most successful plant find was pig face, which grows almost everywhere on cliff tops. When boiled, it tastes like runner beans. The dandelions were a moderate success too. The few feeble specimens we found could be boiled as a green vegetable, but more commonly we made coffee from them. Beverly cut off the roots, then dried them in a tin can pushed into the embers of the fire. When they were dry, she ground the roots into a black powder, which when mixed with water, made a substance not unlike coffee. Unfortunately, as we later discovered to our discomfort, the dandelion drink acted as a powerful laxative. By this stage, the first rush of enthusiasm was wearing a bit thin. With our reduced diet, it was becoming increasingly difficult to perform simple tasks, like humping wood up the hill to the bivouac. Our calorie intake had dropped by 80%. Just the business of keeping the fire going became extraordinarily exhausting. It wasn't surprising that Judith, the oldest member of the party, began to feel her age. Did you want to give it all away this morning? Very much so. Very, very much so. I haven't seen anything worthwhile eating around here, and um, I mean, that what we had for tea last night was very, very nice. But I don't think I could stomach that again. And I just haven't seen anything else. I mean, look at the fiddle ferns and all the rest, but I think, oh, I couldn't. I couldn't. There wasn't much success with the rabbits either. Mike had taken it upon himself to do the rounds of the snares every morning and evening, but the first results were anything but encouraging. If there were occupants of the burrows, they were giving us a wide berth. No good, there's nothing here. It was back to the winkles and oat cakes again, but as evidence of our lowering morale, we were beginning to miss other things from the city too. I miss a comfortable bed. And I'd love some hand cream. My poor hands, a bit like sandpaper. Um, a nice warm bed and a nice big hot bath with plenty of bubbles. And my toothpaste. That's all. Well, quick, quick, quick. Come on, Julie. Quick, grab the axe, Jude. Come on. The goanna which blundered into our camp represented the first real meal that any of us had had for nearly four days. It sat watching our pathetic efforts to catch it with studied indifference. No one thought about the ecological consequences of slaughtering it. We were much too hungry for that.
We cooked the Guyana Aboriginal style in the ashes of the fire. It was four hours before it was done. The emergence. We're just shaking a bit. <laughs> Even after three days without food, some of us were understandably squeamish about eating it. I think we've overcooked him. Mm. It's alright. Mm. What's it like? I don't know, but it's nice. <laughs> it's alright, isn't it? Mmm. Good? Not bad. Mmm. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, one of these a day. <laughs> but so long as you ate it quickly enough and didn't think about it, it was tolerable. Afterwards, we made Goanna stew, which lasted two days. Our bellies were full and we were blissfully unaware that we had just incurred a $200 fine by slaughtering a protected animal. Oh, oh, Greg and Bev were collecting mussels when we killed the goanna. He didn't approve. Um, I must admit that I wasn't particularly taken with it. It sort of brings up a problem that I've been, well, not a problem, but a sort of a misgiving that I've had about the whole thing from the outset, which was just knocking over native Australian fauna needlessly, if you like, you know, and I thought about it and I thought that after a while we'd probably need to, but I just don't feel at this stage it was really needed, you, you know. Feel, you don't I feel don't feel it was needed for me, put it that way. You don't feel hungry enough? No, basically. Not to overcome that, which is, I suppose is a kind of a, an essential sort of an urban oversensitivity to the bush or something, but, you know, it's there nevertheless. Bev? Oh, I wish I'd seen it killed. <laughs> <laughs> You'd feel better about it, you mean? No, it doesn't really bother me seeing it hang up like that now. I had qualms yesterday about killing those crabs, but once they were dead... Yeah, that's true. You enough. know? Yeah, it'd probably be different if you were sort of psyched into the hunt or something. Them. Do you think we were justified in killing the goanna? Mate? For sure. Yeah, if under the same situation, I'd have killed a cow if it had been there. If I'm hungry and I want to live. I'd kill a cow this too. Is it's what not I want cows to we're to talking live. about. I'm not interested in Australian fauna, mate. I just want to live and eat. Mm. <laughs> and I, I know I've got that. Tomorrow it may not be there, you know. Yeah. At the end of the week when wages come round, I don't say, well, save it till next week. I don't need it this week, mate. I, I take my wages every Friday, <laughs> just in case next week doesn't come. A lot of people watching this program, Mike, will probably say that it was very unfair of us to kill the Guyana. What would your attitude to that be? <clears throat> Let them come out here. Uh, no, no, well, uh, yeah, for sure it probably would have been. And um, I think if we could have snared rabbits and if we could have caught fish, then oh, I agree with Greg that the, it was sort of, we didn't have to do it. But as we are not catching rabbits and we're not catching fish, and two of us have been sick already on the, the stew that we cooked up last night, we've just got to find other alternatives. Halfway through the first week, it was becoming obvious that the first camp was a disaster. It was too cold on the ridge. Every morning found us huddled around the campfire, trying to keep warm. We couldn't face the drudgery of chopping down branches to make a new hut, so we used the driftwood we found on the beach. Ecologically, it may not have been as attractive as Hut Mark 1, but at least it was warmer, and it kept the rain out better. But as it happened, the weather improved, and the nights were warmer. Our new campsite had its share of previous tenants. A couple of small black snakes, minuscule, but still very poisonous. Less lethal, but more numerous, were leeches, which clung to our wrists and ankles. Is he sucking now? I can't feel it. No, he's not. And ticks, which plagued us all, day and night. Over the past six days, it's become obvious that sleep, rather than food or the lack of it, have become, has become our biggest single problem. None of us has really had a decent night's sleep since we came here. 
mostly because it's been so very cold, far colder than we expected. Even now in this new shelter where we've got a degree of protection from the wind and so on, it's still been very uncomfortable. Even though we're going to sleep at uh, eight o'clock at night, we're waking probably every hour to restoke the fire and the nights just seem to go on forever. By now, all of us had assumed various roles in our daily routine. Mike became the hunter. Every day he left the camp to inspect his snares and six days running, he came back again, empty-handed. Finally, on the sixth day, Mike found his first rabbit. Only a small one, but it was the first food we'd seen in six days that looked in the remotest way to be acceptable. Not worth talking about anyway. Not worth talking about. Oh, it's good on you. Come see the beans. It's to hell with the beans. Well, there's more beans if you want them. Mmm. Wow. We had been told to stew everything rather than grill it because it was more nutritious. The first rabbit good. was the most delicious that any of us had ever tasted. Mike's expertise at catching and skinning rabbits had already made him the leader in some people's minds. Was he aware of this? Oh, no, I do, I think, what I have to do. Um, somebody's got to do it, haven't they? Somebody's got to catch the food, and I'm the logical one, really, for catching the food, I think. Um, Does it irritate you that some of the others of us are not so competent at catching food? Oh, well, yeah, I must be honest, it does sometimes, when I, you know, I see I'm just lying about doing virtually nothing. Um, I mean, I'm not worried because I don't really get worried about anything, but I am concerned, I suppose. Concerned that at least people should try? Yeah, should do, at least give a token effort or something, you know. Um, oh, I'm not saying that uh, what they're doing is wrong. Possibly they would survive longer than me because I'm expending so much energy and they're sort of taking it easy, which is what everybody says you should do. You know, if you read all the books and the experts, they say, oh, just lie down, relax and take it easy till somebody finds you. Well, I'd rather be found alive than just found a skeleton. You know. The final score of rabbits was five, okay. including a baby one, which we took as a pet, which sat in silent disapproval as we consumed right, his relatives. Right, a cup of black coffee and a nice big cigar. By the beginning of the second week, we were starting to get into an established routine. Although we were weak, it was obvious that we would have to move further afield in search of new food sources. We'd seen a tidal inlet about five miles away. Optimistically, we set off in search of better fishing grounds and perhaps oysters. It was only when we started to walk any distance that we realised how pathetically weak we'd all become. It took us nearly three hours to walk the five miles and we had to rest frequently. Our small supply of oat cakes and our water bottle were all we had to keep us going. We did find an oyster bed but someone had been there before us. The expedition yielded a couple of dozen muddy specimens, enough to fill one corner of our rapidly contracting stomachs. It was to be the only luxury of the entire fortnight. It's hardly what you'd call a commercial proposition, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Most of our efforts to catch and snare animals failed dismally but our manufacturing projects were nothing if not ingenious. Beverly made fish hooks from the bits of tie wire and toughened the wire by flattening it on a stone. Mike and I made a bow and arrow in the hope of hunting a wallaby we'd seen. Julie plaited the drawstring for the bow. The bow worked well enough, but we never got near enough to anything to hit it. Frankly, we had to admit, Stone Age man would have been better equipped. Julie made a fish hook out of a piece of goanna backbone and baited it with rabbit guts. But invariably, the seas were too rough when she ventured onto the rocks to try to catch something. 
we lost count of the number of makeshift hooks, lines and sinkers that she lost. Uh, it's not that we're going wrong, it's just that the conditions aren't suitable, that's all. we just got to find, um, I don't know, clearer water. You caught one fish there, didn't you? Yeah, what yeah, that, that was just luck. That was a bit of old fishing line that we found on the wood heap and a safety pin. But I think it was just luck because I tried for about one and a half hours after that and I didn't even get a nibble. Do you think perhaps you haven't been trying hard enough? Uh, yes, yes. Mm. So what are you going to do from now on, do you think? Well, I don't see that there's much I can do. I mean, Mike's, you can see that Mike's the leader and that Mike likes to... You think Mike's the leader? Oh, definitely. Definitely. He's, he's more or less done everything, hasn't he? Really. Does that really mean, though, we can sit back and let him do everything? What about if something um, happened to Mike? Oh, I think we'd be gone. <laughs> Judith, too, became embarrassed about the contribution she was making. But it was Judith who did all the boring, unpleasant tasks, washing out the billy and the drinking tins, tidying the camp, collecting the firewood. Having left the comfort of her suburban home, she was unconsciously recreating those comforts in the bush. All of the party, to some extent, were still clinging to vestiges of 20th century life. Well, I can't keep up with the hunters. Um, I'm no good at the fishing. And I certainly can't go around eating periwinkles and winkles or whatever it is that Greg does. I, I couldn't do that. I'm no good as a, an official taster, so if everybody's OK, I'll just stop behind and try and keep the place tidy. Does it worry you that... Uh you appear to have adopted the same role here as you would in your own home and taken e us all as your family, virtually. Mm, no, I'm disappointed. I thought I would be able to do things, do more things. And uh, I pictured myself tripping across the fields gaily, chasing rabbits and things like that. <laughs> Just too fast for me. No, uh, no, it doesn't worry me now that I've I yeah, come to terms with it. In deeper water, our homemade fish traps might have been a success. As it was, they took a terrible battering among the rocks. Greg made three, and on the third attempt, his vigilance was rewarded. It's just as well we didn't have to rely on fishing for our sole source of food. Otherwise, we would certainly have starved. The rock cod measured about eight inches, which gave us all two mouthfuls. By the tenth day, we had started to fantasize about the food we were missing. Around the fire, the conversation invariably turned to the food we would most like to be eating. I like an orange. Always have this vision of an orange. <laughs> Beautiful big red. Beautiful big orange orange, very juicy. Well, I fantasized about boiled potatoes and baby carrots for all oh, for days and days. And now I just settle for a lovely poached egg. Mm. I think the only thing really would be a nice good steak and uh, my wife makes a delicious chocolate pudding. You know, I love that. That's about all I really mm. need. And a beer, of course, a beer. Mm. <laughs> At the moment, I wouldn't mind a nice big baked dinner with plenty of potatoes and pumpkin and gravy and parsnips. Towards the end of the second week, we were all gripped by a stultifying lethargy. Our bodies were now lacking essential vitamins and proteins. It had its psychological effects too. Julie couldn't catch any fish and felt depressed about her lack of contribution. Judith felt the need to hunt for food instead of just cooking it but we probably all took her practical work about the camp for granted. Bev felt the presence of the camera crew was adding an artificial dimension to the exercise. Greg didn't feel happy about killing native animals and was more interested in foraging for native plants and shellfish. Mike, the self-made man, didn't have much time for the academics. But on a survival exercise, he was the strongest and most self-reliant of us all, not just physically, but morally as well. Unquestionably, without Mike, we would all have starved.
All of us had a good night's sleep last night, probably the best night's sleep we've had so far, but we've still got this terrible listlessness that I've felt today more than any other time. Just to give you some example, I was trying to cut the top off this can this morning to make a bait tin with, with my knife, and uh, I, I couldn't do it. I just hadn't got the strength to do it. I got so angry, I just threw the can down again. Then I was trying to make another fishing line, and I went down onto the beach, just a few yards down onto the beach, to get a pebble of the right size. And I sat there and I couldn't think why I'd gone down onto the beach. My, my brain was just completely dislocated. I did finally find a pebble, but I must have sat there fully for about five minutes before I remembered why I'd gone there in the first place. Another thing that's quite extraordinary today, for the first time I actually resented the crew who were filming this coming in because they were so fresh and obviously had a good night's sleep from their beds and so on, and I sort of resented their intrusion. I'm coming to a stage now where I'm, I'm sick of rabbit meat and dandelions. I'm sick of going on the beach and hurting my feet every time I walk on the pebbles. I'm sick of smelling all the while and other people smelling. In fact, come to think of it, I'm sick of talking to the camera as well. Our last attempt to catch food was perhaps our most pathetic, a duck trap made of chicken wire and baited with oats. Mike and I sat under a tree in the drizzle and waited. No ducks came. Could we have survived here indefinitely? Uh, not on this particular spot. You'd have had to move around a bit, but eventually, you know, I mean, basically what we were doing was learning how to do it, really, and sort of it would take a much, a much longer time than two weeks to get really to get skills proficient. I don't know, I think we're doing pretty good myself. Um, I think the only, the biggest killer amongst us here is we're tending to go individually instead of sticking together. I think if we all pull together, we could survive here. Especially now we know there's rabbits and ducks and things like that around. Do you feel you've been doing more than your fair share of work? Well, not today, because, you know... No, I don't mean today, you, I mean last week. During the weeks, I have thought this year, certainly. Yeah. Most days I've thought it. Has that aggravated you at all? It has. It's also made me go a little bit harder, too, you know. Yeah. Are you suggesting that some of us aren't pulling their weight? I don't think really any of us have pulled our weight, really. Um, I say, excluding myself, I think if I hadn't have been here, uh, I have wondered what you would have done for food, really. Come on, have you put that out yet? In the end, it was the wet and the cold and our empty stomachs and the endless drudgery of just trying to keep alive that beat us. The Land Rover, which came to take us out on the final day, was a tangible reminder of civilization itself. Physically, we'd reverted to a level of primitive existence, but psychologically, we were still clinging to vestiges of civilization. The irony was that we were living in a primeval world, yet using the most modern of technologies to record what we were doing. We were all humbled by the experience. We drove back to Bermagui and our first normal meal in nearly 14 days. Hamburger with everything, please. Hey, What's that about lobster? Yeah, hamburger with everything for me too, please. Yeah, bacon and egg hamburger with um, onion and uh, tomato. And... Could I have a steak sandwich with everything, please? I don't care what you put on it. <laughs> It took about two hours of solid eating to replace all the fats and poisons in our bodies that we'd so willfully eradicated in the previous two weeks. It was all the wrong food, crammed with cholesterol and things that were bad for us. But we couldn't care less. All the, all the tomato sauce come through. That's beautiful. Mind the rest of stuff. Mm. Okay. In an afternoon's gorging, we largely replaced the average of 10 pounds we had all lost. For the first time, 
we'd known what it was like to be desperately hungry and to be plucked from the comforts of everyday living. It was an ordeal that none of us wanted to repeat ever again. What's so good is the variety. And it's actually on a plate and... Mm. and it's clean. <laughs> it's made it's long all different colours. I'm not even using them. That's right, it was all one colour, wasn't it? Mm.